live shortly. But I think most of us are back, so this is great. And I hope you've had a nice lunch and some rest, maybe. Anyone? Yes? Yeah? That's good. I can see some nods. Uh, some shakes as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the shaky category because something very exciting happened actually during lunchtime. Some of you have been following my uh, posts on Facebook and um, you'll have seen that we're having this beautiful wooden statue um, offered to the monastery in England, all the way from Bali, Indonesia. And it's a very special statue because it's not um, a Buddha statue. It's actually a wood carving of one of the enlightened bhikkhunis of the Buddha's day called Venerable Patachara. Um, and it arrived during my lunch break, <laughs> which I was so delighted about because I was thinking it will probably arrive in the middle of one of the guided meditations. <laughs> but uh, she's here, but she's still wrapped up because apparently the wood can split if it dries out too quickly because there's a 9% of humidity in the wood, apparently, from Bali. So um, she's still wrapped up. <laughs> but uh, I thought that it might be nice to unwrap her towards the end of this retreat and share that momentous unveiling of the awakened feminine with all of you. So you have that to look forward to if you're still with us by then. And otherwise, I'm sure there's other ways that we can we can uh, share that with you. It's very inspiring. It took um, actually laying my eyes on such a beautiful depiction of an awakened bhikkhuni to really get the point about why sometimes we need to be represented. You know, it, it conveys more than words can convey, especially knowing her story about how much suffering she went through, losing her entire family in one day through a series of disasters and, um, and becoming awakened after meeting the teachings of the Buddha. So this particular carved statue has the most serene expression of peace. It's really, it does capture more than any words can describe that sense of total equanimity and yet with that warmth imbued in the smile so I shall be sharing this later it's quite a special um, wood carving and a number of people who've seen it are saying we want one we want one how do we get one <laughs> because there's such a dearth right of anything that represents um, an awakened Buddhist nun when have you seen that represented sometimes with the Tara statues or the Kuan Yin but Personally, I mean, they're very beautiful, but I don't have the same relationship with them that I do with somebody who was um, a historical figure in the time of the Buddha and who comes from the Theravada tradition. It's just somehow more um, impactful and I can relate to that much better. So, yes, I will share that with you. But anyway, I just wanted to recap on this morning and then get into a little bit more about breath meditation and how to make peace with our breathing uh, this afternoon. Um, one of the reasons is that it's still part of the first Satipatthana, Kayanapasana. Uh, the breath is considered another of the bodies within the body. So this body of breath is a, a little entity in and of itself that we can use to further still and quieten our mind and gain insight into the characteristics of uh, suffering, impermanence and non-self. So, and also the other reason I wanted to share this is because one method doesn't work for everyone. And although I think that body um, scanning or, you know, a mindfulness of the body is almost universally helpful and a really good way to get into the meditation practice when you first arrive on your cushion, some people prefer working with the breath straight away. Other people may come to the breath later on in their practice when their mind is sufficiently settled to do that. Um, but one thing doesn't work for everyone and nor does one thing work for the same person all the time in every situation. So it's good to have a whole range of different tools we can use for different purposes. Just as I tried to use like a knife to open the box that the statue came in, it was quite quite comical really I lost the scissors and I was like going at this box trying to get into it and had to remind myself be gentle <laughs> you don't want to suddenly puncture a hole in it or uh, anyway perish the thought she came out in one piece <laughs> so yeah starting with the body is great because it relaxes ourselves and it, it optimizes our health and it's also a really good place to start just to establish that basic amount of mindfulness 
um, on the cushion as well as in daily life. You know, you could have, you've all been hopefully having some lunch, maybe cooking for yourselves or having something you prepared earlier, maybe washing the dishes and all of these activities, we can be aware of the sensations on our hands as we're washing the dishes or, you know, when you walk up the stairs, maybe you can be aware of your hand on the railing. I've noticed during these um, pandemic days that it's really helpful to know what I'm doing with my hands, especially when I'm out walking and I don't want to touch any gates, you know, you can be aware of not touching <laughs> banisters and pillars and handles and all, all the rest. Sometimes I even get this really strong sensation in my hand if I've, say, touched a bag of shopping that I'm not sure it's clean. And then I have this kind of feeling that this hand is not to be used anywhere. And there's a lot of mindfulness in that hand at that time until it's been washed under the tap. So it, it's really useful in all kinds of ways. But there's another story. Um, I think it's a book by Jack Cornfield called The Great Buddhist Masters. And uh, this was about a farmer in Burma who wanted to become a monk. And he was just a very simple farmer um, who had a family and a wife to support course in those days it was you know traditionally the men still sometimes in some cultures even the west sometimes that um, the men are the main breadwinner but anyway he was the one that plowed the fields and and um, was responsible for supporting his family so he realized he couldn't just renounce that duty he had that duty towards those he loved um, but he decided to work extra hard for a few years so that um, he could leave and, and ordain and all that time, he was so aware of what he was doing. He was constantly aware of the contact between his hand and the, I don't know, the bullet cart or whatever it was he was using to plough the fields. Um, that when he went to the monastery, eventually, he practised so well that within, I think, three or four months, he'd apparently attained all the stages of awakening and people got to hear about this and thought that can't be true how can somebody you know reach the end of suffering the complete eradication of all craving for sensuality for existence for non-existence you know and be completely at peace within such a short time so they went to meet him to ask him questions and then they found um what he'd been doing all that time in his household life you know in preparation for his time as a monk and, uh, and they said, okay, yeah, now we understand perhaps it was possible because he had that foundation, the Kayanupasana, body awareness, so strong. And probably at that time too, he was aware that every time um, there is contact at any one of the sense doors, whether that's the eye sense door, seeing form or the ear sense door, hearing sounds, hearing harsh words, kind words, or the body sense door, feeling physical touch, tangible sensations there's this key link at this point because of contact the buddha said feeling arises vedana arises and it's because of that feeling and our reaction to that feeling that we can then move into the next link in what's called dependent origination the arising of suffering and that link the feeling link turns into craving yeah those of you who are Buddhists or who've been coming and practicing for a while might be familiar with this. Or the people who are just starting might not. But the basic premise is that once there's a sensation in the body, it has an opportunity to generate craving in us if we're not aware. Yeah. But at the same time, there's an opportunity there not to move into craving, to move into clinging, if we can just observe that feeling as a feeling. So staying at that bare level of contact that bare level of sensation with equanimity, I would say with kindness and not allow the mind to move in unwholesome ways. So in a sense, we can kind of weaken that chain of what's called dependent arising, the dependent arising of suffering at that point of sensation, that point of contact. So it's a very profound practice. And of course it helps us to become aware of our emotional world as well. But as I said, the breath meditation is another aspect of body awareness. And um, the Buddha actually said that one who completes um, breath meditation um, to the point where they're able to enter very deep states of stillness in the mind called jhana or samadhi. Samadhi is a more general term, but jhana is specific, it's a specific depth of samadhi. 
Um, anyone who is able to practice that way completes the four satipatthanas. So it's very interesting. You don't actually have to go through the satipatthanas like one by one, going through the body contemplations, then going through the breath, then going to awareness of mental contents. You can complete all of that just by observing your breath. So this is really interesting because in that sense, it's a very simple method. It was the Buddha's own preferred method of meditation. Um, and it is a vehicle to those deep meditations, which are very, very resourcing. Not only that, but the deep meditations of jhana are states which are free from the five hindrances. Um, I don't know how many people have heard of the five hindrances. I have to kind of go over the basics, otherwise these talks are not complete. But the five hindrances, um, the Buddha defined as obscurations of the mind, or in a sense, like coverings of the mind, that weaken wisdom. And he said that as long as these five hindrances are present in the mind, one cannot see things as they really are because we always have craving, aversion, doubt, confusion, tiredness, restlessness, um, basically obscuring um, a clear picture of reality. So it's easy to see that in your daily life. If you have a particular craving that somebody be a certain way, you'll only notice all the ways that they're not fulfilling that, <laughs> right? Or you'll just be on the lookout for that particular thing you want them to do. If you have, say, anger or irritation towards something, or you wake up in an angry mood, you tend to view the world in through a negative lens. You see all the faults, you see all the things that other people are doing that they shouldn't be doing, all the things that you're doing that you don't like about yourself. You know, just because there is that sort of uh, aversion, that anger, ill will in your mind. So we're not seeing things clearly at that time. You know? And sometimes we think we are, but these hindrances are very subtle. And the Buddha actually said um, that only, let's have a look. I actually have a proper quote here. He said that when you do not experience those deep meditations called jhana, the five hindrances, together with discontent, arati, and weariness, tandi, invade your mind and remain. But when you do experience a deep meditation, a jhana, the five hindrances, discontent and weariness do not invade your mind and remain. So that means that these um, deeper states of meditation really overcome those, um, those hindrances that stop us seeing things as they are. And this is only a temporary overcoming at first, but it, is, it does give you an opportunity to see things you may not have seen before. So further, the Buddha says in the Samyutta Nikaya, when you experience jhana, you can understand things as they really are. And what do you understand as it really is? The origin and passing away of form. That's the body in this context. The origin and passing away of experience or sensation, Vedana. The origin and passing away of perception. The origin and passing away of mental formations principally will, and the origin and passing away of consciousness. So we're able to see things that we wouldn't normally be able to see because our mind is so strong. And by, you know, practicing with the breath, if our mind is ready for that, we're simplifying the mind and we're gaining a lot of power to look in at one thing for prolonged periods of time and allow that mindfulness to really, really build on that particular object. So it's not an easy practice for many people. And one of the problems is we have this kind of push-pull uh, struggle type relationship with the breath. The breath is kind of there for one minute and then your mind's off somewhere else. And before you know it, the breath's disappeared. And uh, most teachers say, oh, just, you know, every time you realize that, bring the breath back. But personally, I never found that altogether helpful. Um, maybe that's just me. Maybe I've got a very rebellious mind, but 
it just felt so tiresome to constantly be chasing after this breath and kind of bringing it back again and again. And, and there wasn't a lot of joy in it, to be honest. So at this time in my practice, I was mostly practicing the Vipassana method taught by Esen Goenka. And we'd have three days of this Anapana practice of breath meditation before we'd move into doing the body scan and observing sensations and on that fourth day when we could switch to observing sensations I was so relieved you know I'd be just like oh thank goodness my mind's got space to move now and start to investigate and explore because it just felt so confined and so pressed and sort of pushed against my own mind's will really into this small space so it was really a relief <laughs> when I could move away from the breath. And now I actually approach meditation in the opposite way. So I actually start with the body awareness and I build up my mindfulness and my kindness on the body. And then when the mindfulness is already quite strong and when I already have a feel for what kindness and gentleness is, then I allow the breath to come to me. And this is totally different totally different so <laughs> one of the ways that I feel this is different is again around befriending being friendly to you know the breath it's like if you've got a friend you don't kind of go to their house and drag them out of their home and say come on I want you to come over you know come and stay with me come on come around to my place <laughs> no you stay at home you prepare a nice home and then you phone your friend up and you say, I'd really like to invite you around for a cup of tea. Would you like to come in? And guess what? You know, if you have a cosy home and it's a welcoming space, your friend may come of their own accord. And you don't say to your friend, you know, I want you to stay from 2.30 in the afternoon till 5 p.m. You can't leave before that, even if you really need to get back home. Uh, you mustn't leave five minutes after that either because that's the time I need to do the washing up no you don't say that <laughs> you say to your friend oh you're very welcome to come around you know I've got some nice tea to share <laughs> I like tea uh, maybe some cakes and you know stay as long as you want maybe you have some sort of time limit but well you know you're willing to stretch it for a good friend and if your friend wants to leave early you say well thanks for coming you know you can always come back another time right so in a similar way, can we just stay home in our minds? Can we stay home with that kindness and create a beautiful space, an attractive home in our heart in which to invite the breath in? And if that breath wants to come in, welcome it. You know, Don't take it for granted. Don't say, right, now you're here. I'm going to watch 20 or 30 or 60 breaths. No, just this one breath. So we just allow this breath to come in. And we're with that breath all the way through from the start to finish, from the, uh, the inhalation all the way through till the inhalation stops and all the way from uh, the start of the exhalation until it leaves. We're not worried about the next breath. We're just worried about entertaining, keeping company with this one breath happening now. And again, you know, using compassion, befriending the breath with a compassionate attitude an attitude of care, of warmth, of non-judgment. It's not like, oh, you're my breath. You should be long, you should be short. Why are you so rough? Why are you so uneven? No, we don't have to judge the breath in that way. The breath is really interesting because it's also a window into the mind. You'll notice sometimes that your breath, if you've been unwrapping a statue with a, with a knife, <laughs> your breath's a little bit uh, shallow and... Uh, jaggedy and then when you sit down to meditate sometimes you just take a couple of deep breaths because it's such a, re a relief to be seated and you'll notice if you're staying with the breath for a longer period it does naturally start to quieten down in its own time but one breath's no better than another breath it's just air right it's just air coming in and out and the body's incredibly intelligent it knows exactly how much air it needs to take yeah. Of course, sometimes we may have a panic attack or there may be something where, you know, we feel startled and the breath is coming in more strongly than need be. But again, if we can learn to relax with that, we'll find that the breath will start to slow down 
And when the breath starts to slow down, the body and the mind becomes relaxed. Sometimes I also experienced a bit of anxiety at times during this pandemic. I'm trying to remember it was probably a bit earlier on and also before my rains retreat because a few things happened and I thought, oh my goodness, now this big sort of, not really big disaster, but a few things happened just as I was about to begin and I was a bit stressed thinking I wouldn't be able to have my interviews with my teacher. And, and I had a bit of a sort of anxious moment. And at that time, I remembered there were also some breathing methods that you can sometimes do. Because the breath is one of those things that can be both intentional and unintentional. And sometimes we can actually modify our breath to calm down our mind. So I wouldn't suggest that necessarily in the meditation practice, but in your daily life, it can be really helpful to know. And I think this particular breathing was um, like breathing in four, I think, and breathing out seven. I think breathing in four and then holding a little bit, breathing out seven, breathing in four, holding it, maybe for two or three, breathing out seven. The main point there is that the out breath is longer than the in breath because the out breath has this relaxing effect. So it's also helpful to make peace with the breath through again, relating to it as not me, not mine, not a self. Obviously the breath is not me, it's not a self, but we do sometimes think it's mine. We try to sort of possess it and think we should control it to some degree. But remember, even this word breath, it's just a conventional designation for something which is really just oxygen and carbon dioxide and I don't know, probably some other gases in there. It's just the air coming in and out of your body. It doesn't really belong to you. Yeah, so we all share the same air. And as we breathe out, that air goes back to nature and gives a gift of carbon dioxide to the trees and the plants around us. We breathe it in as a gift from those trees and plants. So does it really belong to us? The beauty of realizing that it doesn't belong to us, we have no ownership or, is that we stop trying to control. It's like, what's the point trying to control an element of nature? And the other way of making peace with the breath is to learn to relate to it with a sense of wonder, a sense of awe and respect. Like it's just incredible that from the time we've been born, our bodies started breathing, you know, from the time we came out of our mother's womb. If we hadn't have taken a breath for the first minute or so, we'd have gone into distress. Our brains would have been deprived of oxygen. We may not have made it. Think of all the people around you who would panic if you weren't able to breathe for a minute or two minutes, what would happen? It's really incredible that this breath just keeps on coming in, going out, regardless of whether we ask it to or not. So when we really listen deeply to the breath, our minds become subtler. And the breath is a subtle object that requires a very gentle touch. So as our minds do gain in mindfulness, they do gain in stability and, and this sort of um, continuity of awareness, we're able to tune up with subtler and subtler objects and really start to notice the delight in just one simple breath. It sounds so weird now in a world of materialism where we're always chasing after thrills and the next biggest hit, <laughs> but to realize that you can be satisfied just sitting and noticing that you're breathing, just being aware of, to this one breath, becoming alive to this one simple breath can bring so much contentment and peace. And the Buddha said, you know, that the foundation for breath meditation is a life of simplicity. It is a life of virtue, contentment and peace. We start to find happiness in different places to what we're used to. Happiness in letting go of accumulation, you know, letting go of excess material, what do you call them? Clutter, really. And living a life of simplicity, finding contentment with little. 
this is an aspect of loving kindness. One is contented and easily satisfied, not proud and demanding in nature. Unburdened by duties and frugal in their ways. So you can see how this training in virtue and simplicity helps us to, you know, train towards recognizing the beauty, even in a simple breath. Our minds are just becoming much more pure and spacious. So how do we practice breath meditation? I would say that getting the attitude right is the majority of the work and also having that foundation of sila, of virtue. The Buddha said that, uh, let me get the Pali for you, sila paribhavito samadhi, maha pala, maha nisamso. And that means um, one who develops samadhi or stillness with the foundation of virtue, that samadhi is of great fruit and great benefit. Yeah. So it's not, again, just, you know, doing whatever you want in your daily life and then forcing your mind to focus. This is not the practice. It's that practice of virtue and purifying the mind, undermining these five hindrances through the way we live and relate to each other that then leads to the stilling of the mind, which is actually based on sila, it's based on virtue, and it has great effect and great fruits because the purification goes deep. It's like creating a building on a really strong foundation, like a pyramid, you know, as opposed to creating a really skinny skyscraper. If you've got a pyramid, the base is huge and it takes a lot longer, okay, to build that foundation. But then when you build it up and build it up to the pyramid, to the peak, it can stay for much longer. And also you can create a much, much taller um, pyramid. I mean, now they've got all this modern equipment, you can make really tall skyscrapers, but without all that, I'm sure that you can make a bigger pyramid than you can a skyscraper because the foundation is so strong. So with that foundation, how do we practice the breath meditation? And as I said, the breath meditation, the four tetrads, the four um, stages, if you like, of breath meditation correspond with the four satipatthanas. So the first tetrad is the tetrad of the body. It completes body awareness. And the Buddha simply says that when breathing in or out a long breath, we're aware that the in-breath or the out-breath are long. Sounds simple enough, right? You're either breathing in a long breath, breathing out a long breath, and you know you are. So that's pretty easy. Then the next one is breathing in a short breath or breathing out a short breath. You're aware that you're breathing in and breathing out a short breath. So the point of these first two is not that it matters whether the breath is long or short. It's just to bring some interest into the observation. It's just to give you something to notice. Yeah, because sometimes, as I say, the breath is quite subtle and we're not really quite sure what we're supposed to focus on. It doesn't look particularly interesting or captivating at first, but at least we can start to see the length of it. And you don't have to give it a name, long or short. It might be somewhere in the middle. It might be sort of medium long or medium short or medium medium or, <laughs> you know, it doesn't really matter. It's just to get some sense that each breath is different also. Yeah? Each breath is different. And then next, the Buddha changes the verb from being aware to learning to experience. So the next one is that we learn to experience the whole of the breath as we breathe in and as we breathe out. So now we're not just aware about whether it's long or short, we're aware of the whole breath. And some people say that this is the breath, the whole body, but actually in the sutta itself, the Buddha writes very clearly here in the Majjhima Nikaya 118 and Anapanasati Sutta. It says, in and out breathing is regarded by the Buddha as a body in the category bodies. So we're aware of the whole body of the breath. We learn to experience the whole of the breath as we breathe in and out. So this is now lending toward continuity of awareness, yeah, unbroken awareness. And of course, you know, the more that you can be with all those subtle sensations of the breath as it comes in and comes out, um, the more you see of it, and the more you see of it, the more interesting it tends to be. Yeah, so your mind learns to stay longer and longer with it, and the breath almost takes up the whole of the mind at this time. 
And then the last one, this is still stage one, but there's four parts in each stage. <laughs> I hope these numbers aren't confusing. It doesn't matter. But um, for those who know the suttas, it will make sense. Um, so the last one is that we learn to calm the breath as we breathe in and out. So the verb he's using here is tisikati. Sikati means training ourselves um, to experience the whole of the breath, training ourselves to calm the breath. And that's actually the same word that they use for the precepts. We learn to observe virtue. virtue. We actually undertake the training, sikati. So the last one, learning to calm the breath, is actually a very natural thing. We don't so much learn to calm it through force. Well, in fact, not at all. We're more learning as to how it calms down. We're more learning about the causes and conditions for its calming. So we just notice that over time the breath calms down. And it'll be interesting for you to see, just as a question for you to sort of notice in the practice, um, what does lead to its calming? Is it when you're more making more effort? Is it when you're more um, present with the breath or um, you have more focus with the breath? Or is it actually when you're able to step back a little bit and stop interfering with the breath? Is that when it calms down? I mean, I have my own um, sort of hypothesis there and I keep watching and keep learning, but um, it might be interesting to discover that. Mm. And then the next tetrad, I won't go further than this, but the next one, which may come up for you naturally again, is that um, the next one is, is learning to experience joy with the breath. And this particular tetrad corresponds to Vedana Nupasana, the second Satipatthana, because we're learning about feelings, yeah? And in this case, we're learning about pleasant feelings called Piti Sukha. I have to introduce my little bear at this point. Okay, because the hosts also asked me if I'm going to introduce her. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll think, why have I got a teddy bear up there? Well, this is actually Venerable Piti Sukha. That is her name. And she's the Britain's first ordained teddy bear, fully ordained. And uh, she was ordained during my men's retreat <laughs> with some spare rag robes. So there we go. And then my mum was very kind. My mum visited in October and she um, thought that she might get cold over the winter. So she crocheted a beanie for Venerable P.T. Sukha Bear. So even my mum's getting soft now like that because I think she would have thought I was completely nuts a couple of years ago. <laughs> it's just a bit of fun and lightheartedness and um, in Perth where my teacher lives we often meditate with teddy bears just to bring us that little bit of gentleness and a bit of joy and playfulness as well so this is my first bikuni aspirant because I don't have a real life one so <laughs> but this is a great one because she's always in noble silence quite amazing you can't really get her to say anything at all <laughs> isn't it <laughs> So anyway, that's Venerable Piti Sukha, and the reason I mention her now is because um, in this second tetrad, we're learning to experience Piti as we breathe in and out. Piti is a kind of joy, a kind of rapture that comes when we develop interest in the breath, and our mind starts to kind of want to stay with the breath. And because we want to stay with it, and it's starting to interest us, um, we can relax our effort even more and just flow with the breath so that the breath starts to feel really pleasant, really, really relaxing. And you might even find waves of joy starting to arise in your body and mind along with that breath. And so this is part of the practice and it's to be expect not expected, but it's um, a natural phenomena that can occur. So don't worry if that happens because sometimes people think, oh, I'm not supposed to enjoy my meditation, but in fact you are. And then the second one is that we learn to experience sukha as we breathe in and out. And actually at this stage of meditation, which is pre-deep jhana meditation, piti and sukha are kind of, they come together really. They're very similar. Piti is more like rapture if you want. And sukha to me feels a little bit more subtle, more like a contented kind of happiness, but they're really so close that it's almost impossible to distinguish and you don't really need to either. And then 
Once this joy starts to arise with the breath, we learn to experience the mental formation of that PT Sukha as we breathe in and out. Now that sounds a bit technical, but what it's really saying is that the, the joy starts to become more and more subtle and it starts to become more mental. So you're moving from the body as the sort of main sense door through which we experience things towards the mind and the way the mind experiences the breath. So the breath is becoming increasingly subtle and the PT Sukha is, is happening in the mind. Vedana sensation is actually a mental kanda. It's actually a mental one, but it's experienced usually through the body door. So at this point, the body is becoming much subtler. The breath is becoming much subtler and the joy is almost taking over the breath. Yeah, so at this point, you know, sometimes the breath actually um, is still there. It may be fading into the background and, and joy seems to be the main object. So if that happens, that's perfectly fine. Just go with that. And then the last one is that we learn to calm that mental formation of Piti Sukha as we breathe in and out. And again, learning to calm just means we learn how it calms, we learn how it starts to calm down. So, you know, the whole journey you can see is a path towards simplicity, increasing peace, and a kind of refinement of a very wholesome type of happiness. Yeah, so it's all along that same theme of making peace. We approach the breath with friendliness, with peace, with an attitude of letting go. And the breath slowly starts to stay in our awareness for longer and longer you know the joy starts to arise the joy is not in the breath the joy is in the mind because the mind is becoming you know increasingly free from these hindrances the mindfulness is becoming stronger and as the mind is more energized then joy naturally starts to arise in the mind and after a while we feel very satisfied with that joy and so the joy starts to calm yeah, we don't, it's almost like you, you have your fill in a way and then we just can relax with it. So it all starts to settle down and calm. And we start to experience, as I say, an increasingly subtle kind of happiness as the mind becomes subtler and subtler, more and more still. So this is the general trajectory of breath meditation. There's, there's more to be said about that when we do um, go into the deep, really deep meditation. But so long as you're, you know, learning to relate to the breath kindly and wisely, gently, and as I say, staying at home, not dragging the breath in, <laughs> inviting your friends no, to enjoy the cup of tea and letting them come in and leave at their own free will. And as long as we generally um, learn how we're relating to the breath and how that affects our experience, yeah? So again, those three questions, what am I doing? How is it affecting me? Where is it leading me? Is it leading towards peace? Is it leading towards a stillness in the mind? Or is it leading to more agitation and a kind of battle with the objects of your mind? If that's the case, just pull back slightly, let go. You know, if you're not ready for the breath, that's fine. Just stay with the body awareness. Just make peace, be kind to everything that's arising. And you'll find the process of meditation unfolds quite naturally in its own time. Yeah. So this is another aspect of being gentle, being kind, allowing things to take their time. Okay. So with that... I'm going over time again a little bit, but um, we've still got time for some meditation. Uh, I, I'll still try and do half an hour's meditation before the walking session. So please have a stretch if you need to, or just adjust yourself so that you're sitting as comfortably as can be. Make sure you're warm enough. I don't know about you, but I don't have my heating on at this time of day, so I have to Make sure I'm still warm. And we are going to have a bit of movement after this half hour, so don't worry, you're not um, confined you're not going to be confined in one place for too long 
I should have said earlier also that if you ever need to move during the meditation, that's really fine. You know, sometimes we feel ready to like observe and investigate painful feelings or tensions and aches. Other times we just don't have that mental strength at that time or it feels like it might actually harm the body. So if you have to move, it's fine. Just try to do so with awareness, with gentleness and knowing the purpose. The purpose in this case is to look after your body and mind. Oh, you all look so comfy now. It's lovely. <laughs> Good. Cozy hats, cozy blankets. Great. All right. So as usual, this is just a suggestion. You don't have to follow what I say. I do think it's important to be kind, though. Or else. <laughs> Okay. So just turning your attention inside the temple of your body and mind. And again, with my eyes closed, I notice my uncles need a little bit more space. You may find you also need to make adjustments. And this is all part of the meditation, part of caring, establishing the right intention. This meditation is your gift to yourself, the gift of a precious half hour to relax, let go of any sense of being, getting anywhere, needing to be anyone prove anything. No one but you knows what's happening inside your mind. No one but you can care for that. So just starting the meditation by gently Spreading loving awareness, kindfulness. Right through your body. As though mindfulness were like the light of the sun. Bringing to light any sensations in your body. And kindness is inseparable from the light of the sun. It's the warm of the sun's golden rays. So imagining your awareness, your kindfulness, soaking your entire body. Though you were bathing in the golden light of the sun. Allowing your awareness to spread very naturally. Relaxing, soothing any tensions Maybe even physical illnesses, ailments, pain. 
as though those golden sun's rays were swirling around those areas. Healing, bringing comfort and warmth. Noticing areas that maybe don't have particularly strong sensations also. They also are in need of your care. Your attention, your deep listening. including anything that arises in your field of awareness, including that in this kindness, whether it be the sound of a strange drilling noise next door, maybe other disturbances in your environment, welcoming them in. Treating them not as disturbances, but as friends. Here to help strengthen your qualities of kindness, patience, acceptance, equanimity. Noticing how these experiences, sensations in the body are always happening in this present moment. Constantly changing. rising just to pass away. And as your mindfulness remains present, receptive to these sensations, it comes closer and closer into the center of time. Free from the burdens 
pots. Concerns about the future. This moment is where you're fully alive. You can notice the simplicity of just being here now. Making peace with this moment, with the next. The next, building peace, one moment at a time. may start to notice silence between the thoughts coming in and out of your mind. Peace of silence. And as the mind becomes more peaceful, more present, more still, you might notice this subtle phenomena of the breath.
How does it feel to breathe in, to breathe out? To be fully present with just one breath. To regard this breath as a very dear, slightly shy friend who's come to visit. To greet them with a smile. may start to notice whether the breath is long or short. Just listening, getting to know this very precious guest to your mind. So this one breath now, the most important thing in the world. Finding just the right way of handling the breath. Staying present, but not too close. As though holding out a very gentle hand. Learning to relax, become at ease in the presence of the breath. And if that breath disappears or is not ready to stay, just making peace with whatever arises in this moment, in your own body and mind.
just notice if you can pick up any delight, sense of subtle pleasure in the breath. Not looking for something extraordinary, but just noticing the peace, the pleasure that's already there. With a mind that's contented with little Contented with just one simple, humble breath. And allowing your mind to rest on that breath. relax any effort at all. So we're coming close to the end of this meditation. If you wish to continue, please feel free to do so. For those who prefer, we're going to move into a period of walking meditation. So in your own time, if you wish, you can gently open your eyes and see if you can keep close to yourself, to your mind, to your body. Taking any peace that you've developed in this sitting straight into your walking meditation. Suggesting you just get a drink of water if you need to have a drink. Save the cup of tea for later so that you can build up a bit of continuity to the next session. And we'll meet again in 20 minutes at three for a 20 minute silent meditation sit. So the meeting will remain open. You can go and do your walking if you wish and just come back around three and we'll sit together quietly, okay?